All right. So, um, cast your minds back before last week. We were discussing Joshua. Um, hopefully, this book will be more relevant to you now after what we discussed last week. Preparation, going out into a land, getting ready. Okay, and remember we started, what did we discuss the week before? What did we discuss? We're on chapter 4, by the way. So someone tells me. <laughs> what did we discuss? The the R print out before them. So we discussed the crossing of the Jordan, right? Yeah. Or this building up to it. And remember, he goes out and he prepares them. And he says to them, in three days' time, you need to get ready, we're going to go. Yeah. Right? Anything else? Uh, we looked at the we looked at the contents of the ark. We looked at the different both copies of the ketubah, Aaron's staff, and the manna. Right. Uh, the ark was made out of acacia, which is thorny and stubborn. It was moldable, uh, sort of very much the image of man. It was covered by gold. Uh, the outside was uh, was bronze and silver. Um, you're not made for a wilderness, but you're made for a promised land. Okay. The, sort of the main point that I think I've got to take care of. Alright. So I'm just going to read the paragraph just above so we can set context, if you guys are right with that. So, chapter 3, verse, let's go from 14. So the people left their tents to cross the Yarden. With the Kohanim carrying the Ark of the Covenant, head of the people. When those carrying the Ark had come to the Yarden and the, and the Kohanim carrying the Ark waded into the water, for throughout the harvest season the Yarden overflows its banks, the water upstream stood piled up like an embankment for a great distance at Adam. And remember, we made that the flats of Adma, which is basically mud flats bringing you back to the Garden of Eden, right? Adama, which is? What is Adama? Dust. Dust, right? <coughs> so again, he is bringing them back. It is not per chance. Their crossing happens here. What is he trying to tell them? Nice question. What else? What about coming into the inheritance that is an important thing that he's putting them at a place called Adma or Adam? <laughs> You know, okay, Shuni is saying that you must remember where you come from. Was Adam created by accident? No. Was he created for a purpose? Yes. If Israel was a man created by God, what was he created for? To reclaim the land. To go into the land. Right. Which was a promise of what his father, <coughs> the father of many nations, who am I talking about? Abraham has already been received the promise that his son is going to go into that land. Okay? So he's going to go in. This is the thing that was set up. You were made to go in. This is now your time. Alright? Uh, the city next to Tzatzan, so that the water flowing downstream toward the Sea of Areva. The Dead Sea was completely cut off and the people crossed over right by Jericho. The Kohanim carrying the ark for the covenant of Adonai stood fast on dry ground in the middle of the Yarden while all Israel crossed on dry ground until their entire nation had finished crossing the Yarden. It tells you again a story. Dry ground crossing. Where else have we seen this before? The Red Sea crossing. What was he doing then? Bring his people, okay? And tell me, if God is busy teaching, which he always is, right? What is the illustration? You were what? Slaves. Slaves, okay? You were slaves to Mitzrayim. What does Mitzrayim mean? Bondage. Bondage. Okay? The world, if you want to make an illustration. I pull you out of bondage, 
and you cross on dry ground. It's a very, it's a very interesting little, little parallel because what happens is the chariots that chase them down, or try to chase them down, in the Hebrew it says they went on them. Right? So he uses the firm footedness, I will make a way for you for that time. For those of you who are getting a poke about an African country, you have a time to cross. And it will be firm and it will be sure footed. Okay? Then the enemy is coming to try and chase them down. And he uses this water to trap them up so they cannot just glide through and chase them down. The wheels stick in mud. They don't get traction. They can't move as fast. That thing that you trusted in, trying to chase them down, is what traps them. And then they get washed away. So now you were slaves, and now you are free. Free to do what? <laughs> Hang on, yes, Andy? Liberty with responsibility. Right. But they don't see that yet. Okay, so what happens? What is common theology today? You were free from the world, right? And you've been set free in Christ. Right, the boss of the Lamb. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Free for what? So, oh, yeah. so people don't see that. They think the law, Torah, or the Ketubah, that was given in Sunday nice morning. Mm -hmm. Right? So you were freed to come into a place, to bring them to a place to put them into bondage again. That's the theology. Is it right? No. no. Right. So God goes through all of it to free them, to put them into bondage again. No. What they don't understand is they were freed to follow. It becomes a choice now. The crucifixion becomes a choice. I'm going to do something for you. It is your choice now whether or not you're going to follow. Okay? And it's an invitation. I'm not going to force you to do it. I want you to be in a relationship and I want us to go forward together. I was holding out his hand and he says, let me show you who I am. And he takes them again. Mara, Mana, Quail, Elim. All bother revealing pieces about himself to get them to the place of Simon. You see, you're no good in the promised land without the promised covenant. Your heart doesn't change. You have to come into the point of relationship. If you come into the point of relationship, then you can go and claim inheritance because you have a responsibility. What is your responsibility? What is the point? Kingdom of priests, what is the point? To obey his Sorry, To obey his mitzvot because... What is that going to do? So you can be a peculiar treasure to me. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's that's nice what is that going to do with everybody else? Be alive. Salt. Mm -hmm. salt, light, so kingdom of priests. Give me a specific picture. What was a priest to an Egyptian man? What did he do? What was his function? To represent his God. To show them their God. If you're angry, mer angry merciless, vengeful, and you're a priest, that's how your God is. Let's take out human flaw. What's at stake here? Misrepresentation of God Himself. That's why they say that the, the old government is, oh no, that is a vengeful God and he's killing people and he's horrible. That's bad, been now bad, in the new covenant. I this yesterday. Bad, 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 bad theology. Yeah, right? I had this, this yesterday. Yeah, what they, don't, what they don't understand, the new covenant is in the old covenant, the old covenant is about keeping Torah, <coughs> right? And so is the new. Right. But we're not going to go into that. I'll be here till Wednesday. What That's I fine. need you to see is, right, you have a job to do. If I put my Torah in, if I give you this relationship, <coughs> what is Torah going to help me do? It's going to help me live in a way that's going to please my father, and thus it's going to set me apart so you can become holy. And it's also going to help me, as we spoke about the thing that makes the way through the water, vacation is covered with gold. 
It's a picture of what Messiah is going to do. You're covered with His righteousness. Right? And as the Chupa covers you as a nation and as you move forward, you're moving to it, reflecting Him, God willing. Now you stop and think a second just for this week, and we push some buttons. If I stop then I freeze frame, at one point in this week, when you were 100% reflecting God. You charge. Stop and think. When people were confused, were you compassionate? When people hurt you, did you beat them back? Or were you patient? Were you slow to anger? Were you full of grace? This is a tough call, guys, but remember the cost is big. The effect is, if I get this right, someone's eternity will become cemented. Not because I can do anything, but God can do things through me that will help them understand who He is. You're a mirror. You might be the only mirror they see. And for people in this room, you are Torah observant, Israel. Let me see your heart by what you do and how you act towards your brother. It doesn't matter that you follow Torah to the T. You can do all the outward signs of a Shabbat keeping and your heart is not there. Abba says, well, what's the point of it? I want your heart. I want relationship. I want you and me to go and show the world who I am. I'm giving this to you. And I want you to be part of it. You're going to reflect me in the fullness of this. And I'm going to put you two in a place where we cannot get away from the fact that nations upon nations are going to walk through your roads and they're going to see me through you. If that's what he's setting up at play here, he has to do something with the heart first. <coughs> We've got two big problems we were discussing a little bit this morning. Is that people want to be, they want to get out of Egypt, but they want to hold on to it at the same time. Yeah, what was their, their, their grumblings all about? <laughs> it's uncomfortable. Provision. 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 I don't know what, everything is nostalgic, isn't it? They didn't enjoy the refining, but I think it's a lot of mine. Well, it's not just about refining. Remember, he's revealing himself to a people. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, he's going, listen. I'm going to show you who I am. But if you're not available for the lessons, all you're going to see is the beating. Three days without water. Is anybody having a good time without three days of water? No. And Abba uses that difficulty to show you who he is. What I want to do, what I want to be for you. But if we're so busy fixated on the water, you forget the revelation. Sorry, can we link that to the great and terrible day? I know that we're busy in Revelation. But at the end of the day, it's a great and terrible day with three days without water when you're showing this is the Father. No, the great and terrible day is going to be worse. No, no, but, but uh, it's, it's a foreshadowing almost. No. no. He wants to show that He's living water. Okay. He wants to show them that He can heal the water. He wants to show them that He will live. And again, foreshadows of Christ, most definitely. If anybody's thirsty, come to me. I'm the difference between life and death. You're going out and you're parched mouth and you don't know where you're going to get that sustenance. You don't know where you're going to get something to quench your thirst. If, think about the time before you knew Christ. Some of you not too long ago. Some of you quite long ago. But surely you can remember the emptiness and the dryness that you have. Something was missing. Something wasn't right. No matter what you tried to find or fill that void with, it was empty. Until you took your first clear sip and then you went, that's what I've been craving for this entire time. Mm -hmm. Right. Now if that's what God wants to relate to a world who's out in the wilderness, and He's giving that pool of water to you, again, you are going to relate to them what is important here. This nation was created for a purpose. You were chosen. You were set free. He's giving you an invitation to come with Him on a journey. Is your heart ready? We struggle with this because we don't want to give up self. We don't want to give up our comforts. We don't want to give up our understanding. We don't want to give up our stuff. And we definitely don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it. It comes down to 
If this pleases my father, why shouldn't I do it? Not give me one good reason why I should. You see how the question changes? Mm -hmm. It immediately identifies for me where your heart is at. Now, Egypt had a big hole in the Israelites as much as it was, the easy part was <coughs> getting them out of Egypt. <coughs> now think about that for a second. All of those plagues, all of those signs, all of those wonders for God to reveal Himself to the world and the hard part wasn't even done yet. The hard part is letting you let go of you. Now you go through this wilderness process and He wants to come into you and He wants to reveal Himself to you and He wants you to let go of things and He wants you to understand that I'm going to do something new and exciting in you and I want you to understand that you did it that way before but now standing at my mountain, this is how I want you to do it and this is how we're going to do it from then on because this is what's going to bring eternal fruit. Are you in or you out? That's your option. And if, God willing, you grab it with both hands, and let's say Cinderella story, you know, it didn't happen this way. And you run towards the promised land. You're holding out to go into a land with fullness and potential that He's prepared for you. Stop and think. Who planted all the fields? Who put all the trees in place? Who built all the cities? He had that done because He knew you were coming. So, we worry about his provision. Have you stopped and considered what he's got already waiting for you here? But you're still looking so bad that you think that's where everything is? No, that's right. There's nothing on what I'm going to give you. But you can't have any of the physical stuff without the hard stuff. You're there to reflect me. All the other stuff is secondary. It's a gift. I love you. I want to take care of you. I want you to be happy. I want you to be secure. I want you to be in a position where you are going to be able to focus on me. And I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to go out for, before you. I'm going to come in behind you. I'm going to make the way. I'm going to open up that, that <coughs> unique I'm going to make you a new creation. You were a slave and now you're free. Now you have a choice to make. Am I free to do whatever I want? No. You will become a slave to righteousness. What's righteousness? Understanding with God. Well, that's a nice definition, but what is it practically? Obedience. Obedience to Torah, but also it says those who believe are righteous. This is important. If I believe God is God and I, He is my Father and I become His Son, surely then should bring obedience. I am willingly taking that onto me and saying, you know what, Abba, you gave me life, I love you, I'm going to give you life. Yeah, but I, you know, let's talk about kosher eating. Mm. I don't know if the cost was that high. Thank you, Chief. Well, he didn't tell us to eat dust, but he didn't clean it. Yeah, but this is the thing. Do you really like bacon? No. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had interesting discussions with people where they're like, yo, you know? Take a piece of pork and pour some coconut and see what crawls out of there. Oh, wait, no, don't even want to do experience. I don't want to know about your health reasons. I just like bacon. <laughs> and then you stop and you go, is the cost that high? He only died, took a beating. God worked, separated himself from himself, in a sense. Father and son get completely separated for a time because he took all your iniquity on him. He gets separated from God for three days and three nights. He conquers death to get you there and you go, no, I like my pork too much. Stop and consider what you're saying. Your life was so important that he died for you to give you life. He gave you an opportunity for eternal life. And you put stipulations on how much you want to give. Is your eternity worth your life for bacon? Is your eternity worth <coughs> your sexual immorality? Is your eternity worth your Saturday afternoons, your Friday nights? Is your eternity worth 
That's a double ridiculous. Of course not. But what you're telling me with your feet are two completely different things. Kingdom of priests will reflect him, not when they feel like it all the time. Your choice. Are you with me? To become a peculiar treasure, to become salvation to a people that don't know a loving God, but he's righteous and he's just as well. Are you willing to let go of your comfort and just step out of the city for a little bit? Think of Abraham. And just walk a little bit with me in a tent. He left everything behind. He left his kingdom behind. He left everything he knew to go follow after a God he didn't really know or understand. He gave up his life to receive life. And God honored that and he becomes a forefather or the father of a movement, a religion, a relationship. To the point where he trusts him enough that he will even lift up his only beloved son. And that becomes a foreshadow of what God is going to do. Do we then have any other response but to say, Hinani? What does Hinani mean? Here I am. Oh? Here I am for what? Here I am to serve me. Here I am, use me. Here I am at your feet. The same response is at Sinai. You will do everything that he tells us to do. Yes, because we want the blessing, but when you tell me I can't do it in the Egyptian way, then we've got problems. You see, people want to take on the blessing, and listen to me carefully. We want to take the promised land, but we don't want to give up all the stuff that he needs us to let go so that we can go into the promised land. Guys never made it to the promised land because they didn't want to give up self. Your way. Your understanding, your doctrine, your bacon fritters or whatever else you want to put in there. You don't want to let go and let him. At every point in someone's life when they come in, and again, you know, it's simple, uh, it's simple for me, but God broke it down for me in three steps, right? Remember, this is not, this is just how he showed, showed me something, okay? You come in, you're a believer. After believer, Talmud, disciple, and from there you go into leadership. Train up and then you become your own rabbi, and God puts you where he needs to be to help train up other people. Most people, Egypt people, get stuck here, in between these two. Oh, they all believed God was God. They all believed he made a covenant with them. They all knew he existed. What is the difference between a believer and a Talmud, a disciple? Yeah. Uncle Conrad mentioned last week, you mimic him. Scripture clearly says you will become like him. Mimic Yeshua. So what he does, you do. What's the question? <coughs> you stop and you go, yeah, um, yeah but uh, that's really not for me. Really? To become a disciple means to study the scriptures, to understand them as he did, to be able to walk them out as he did. If you saw him in a synagogue on Shabbat as a disciple, you didn't ask why. You said, we're going to synagogue on Shabbat. And the more you walked after him, the more his ways became apparent. To the point where the disciples looked at him and they say, teach me to pray. Now, if this culture is a little bit fuzzy to you, I tell you now, nobody has to teach a Jewish boy how to pray. They've been bombarded with prayers their entire life. And certain rabbis will tell you that you pray this at this point and that. And if you've ever had the privilege of going into a synagogue and listening to a service, it is all just an orderly linking of prayer. Beautiful prayers. But it's in a specific order, and this is how we do it. Why? Because it's Shabbat. But why can't we do this? What do you mean? We sit and we pray. And you go through this thing. What they were asking was, teach me how you pray. Give me the understanding, give me the insight to get me to become like you. They were letting go of self. If he celebrated Pesach, you celebrate Pesach. If he 
walked from one synagogue to the other as a disciple, you walk. This is what you study scripture to do so that you can become like him, so you can bear fruit like him. Now the desire gets flipped on its head. Not what can I get when I move, but other when you're done, may I be like you. When I speak, let them hear you. Let my heart beat like your heart. Let my halakha reflect you to the fullness that they don't even see me anymore and all they do is glorify you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Kingdom of priests, you are there to reflect him in its fullness. This is not a New Testament concept, but the way it was framed in the time is what they finally understood what it cost. Why? Because I'm going to bring you into an inheritance. I'm putting you in a land and there are eternal blessings here. There are things that you can come into and you can hold on to and there's going to be fruit and blessing and reward and things that your father's going to look at you and he's going to go, I'm going to give you the world, not the broken one, the fullness of everything to come. If only you would just let go of what you want. This is all about you. When you become a Talmud, it becomes about what he wants. And God willing, after seven years of being hammered with what He wants, you will think like Him, act like Him, walk like Him, talk like Him. And when someone walks you up to you and goes, Your father says, eating unclean things is okay. You make like Peter and you go, oh, oh, No ways. I've never done that in my life. Don't tell me any different. <coughs> it becomes revelation. It becomes clear conscious understanding of who you serve and what you're here to do. Heavenly perspective. And this is all foreshadows and linking up to crossing to get you to, you're a slave to righteousness, you believe God is real, you will walk in obedience in Torah that will set you apart as holy and to the point where you will be able to lead others in holiness. In right standing. <coughs> yes, in, in your leadership, do you ever actually stop being a disciple? As in your learning process, it never actually stops. You take you take a step from discipleship to leadership, but in some way along the line, don't you almost have to let your ego take a break and go back to being a disciple <coughs> again as well? I think if I, I, the, I hear what you're saying, and it's a very good point, but I think as any leader will tell you, once he's gone through the process is that you continually have to be full so that he can flow you through you to come out the other side. What most leaders, not most leaders, many people, many leadership make the mistake of giving out, they have an exit gate in their dam, but they don't spend enough time with him so they're not being full there. Right. And that's the time when Abba will stop. And scripture clearly dictates something silly like, if your house is not in order, God forbid, my children go through a rough time. My responsibility then is to my family. So I have to negate this part, get my house in order, and then I can come back to it. But I'm going to need the wisdom and discernment of spending time with God to be able to be continually getting full so that I can. I don't believe you ever stop being a disciple if you're following off the Messiah. You're chasing perfection. Okay? It's, it's, it's not an easy thing. There are going to be things that year after year, but I can tell you now, Abba will look at you and go, you're a leader. Act like it. Joshua never once stopped and went, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've arrived. Thank you very much. High fives all around. You'll listen to me like Moses. No, but continually God has to say, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. And to the point where at the end of his life, he must... He, he, he lays it out in front of him and he says, listen guys, can we deny what he's done? And everybody goes, no. He says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not, I have served. Yeah. I will continue. Right? And that continual servitude of reflection.